AI 기술은 날이 갈수록 빠르게 발전하고 있습니다. 가끔은 정말 AI가 우리를 추월하는 게 아닐까? 싶을 정도로 점점 더 똑똑해지고 있는데요. 최근에는 오픈 AR사의 O1 모델이 IQ 120을 넘었다는 소식도 들려옵니다. 이렇게 발전하는 AI, 너무 똑똑해지면 해킹까지 해버리는 것 아닐까요? 그런데 실제로 AI에게 해킹을 시켜보겠다고 엄청난 상금을 건 기관이 있습니다. 바로 달파라는 곳인데요. 달파는 미국 국방부 산하 군사기술연구기관으로 미래 기술에 막대한 자금을 투자하는 곳입니다. 그리고 이 AICC 대회에 단 둘이서 출전해 결승에 진출하고 200만 달러의 상금을 획득한 티오리 멤버가 있습니다. 오늘은 이두 분을 모시고 인터뷰를 진행해 보았습니다. Hi, I'm Tyler Nicewander. I work on research and engineering at Theory. So uh, I'm Tim Becker, and like Tyler, I also work on research and development in uh, theory in the U.S. side of the company. I'm just very thrilled that it did so well in the AICC. You know, we just finished the, I guess, qualification round for the AI Cyber Challenge. Basically, the first place. So we got the first in achievements. We got the first in the number of like different bug classes that we found and everything like that. A team that was just me and Tim working on it. So it was a pretty small team, especially compared to some of the other. Really good teams that that were also participating. So I don't know exactly. But some of the teams have published a little bit of information about who was who was on them. So a lot of them are you know something like twenty, maybe thirty people, which makes sense if you're kind of a group shared between several different institutions. So you know some of them are um, other cybersecurity firms like us. Um, there's also some uh, academic institutions and universities. And some teams, which are combinations of both of those, I'm definitely scared about uh, what they might come up with that we might miss and things like that. There's still a lot of time left. So DARPA is a government agency that funds sort of emerging technologies that are sort of vaguely related to defense or sort of military applications. AIXCC is a competition run by DARPA that encourages teams to create fully automated cyber reasoning systems that find vulnerabilities and fix vulnerabilities in open source software. So it's assuming that you have the source code for some software and you can look at the individual commits of the software and the goal of the automated system is to find the vulnerabilities in those commits and try to fix them. What makes this competition unique is that they give you access to uh, sort of all of the cutting edge large language models. So you can use sort of OpenAI, Anthropic, Google, all of the, the popular LLMs to uh, aid your cyber reasoning system in finding and fixing these vulnerabilities. That's cyber reasoning system. DARPA and the government people really like having acronyms for everything. And so like the system that we produce and submit is called the cyber reasoning system. The challenge that we work on are called challenge problems or CPs. And when we submit a thing, we submit a proof of vulnerability or a POV. And then when we make a patch, we submit a generated patch, a GP. Yeah, so the in, I guess, 2016, DARPA had this Cyber Grand Challenge thing, which was basically the same idea, um, except there were a couple different changes. So there was no source code. It was all compiled programs, and there were no GPUs or AI things. Um, so it was a lot of fuzzing, symbolic execution, static analysis, kind of the traditional uh, security techniques. Um, and then, yeah, I also participated in a Cyber Grand Challenge and was on the, the team that won first place for that in 2016. Yeah, so the, the format for this uh, was kind of interesting. So basically, the way it's set up, as Tim mentioned, it's kind of designed around fixing open source software. And so we submitted our own code for our cyber reasoning system. Um, and then they took that code and they ran it themselves on each of the challenges. So we had no idea kind of what was going on or what would happen. They ran each of the challenges that they had for four hours. And we had $100 of LLM budget that we could spend however we wanted. So what we were given was, again, as Tim mentioned, we basically had an open source repository. So we could see things like 
the commits that were made and the rest of the code base. We also had harnesses. So something like if you were doing fuzzing or something else, just where the input is supposed to go in a program. Because if you imagine something like the Linux kernel, which was one of the challenges, you can have network ports, you can have people typing on a machine, you can have a serial device, you can plug in a mouse or a USB, like there's kind of too many things to be looking at. So they gave us just a few and they told us like, you can put input here, 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 or here, um, and kind of gave us a standardized format for that. And then our system had to find basically where bugs were introduced. So we were able to look at the commits and we had to say, this commit looks like it introduced a bug. And instead of just saying like, it maybe is a bug, we have to say, here's an actual input that we can give to the system. And then if we find one of those, then we also get to patch the code. So we have to submit normal source level patches, which tell us kind of what, what to do to fix the code. So, so yeah, we were looking at the competition for a while in like sort of coming up with some ideas of how we might approach it. But until all of the details that were sort of critical to the competition were finalized, we couldn't really start development. And so when we actually started, it was about a little bit over two months from the deadline. And we tried to implement as many of the sort of simple and robust ideas as we could in those two months. Yeah, so I think we got, we got access in May, kind of like the early May was when we were allowed to like log in and see kind of what the APIs we needed to talk to were supposed to look like basically got access to anything. And then July 15th was when we had to have everything submitted. And then we also had a couple other things that we had to do in the meantime for other work obligations. So it ended up being yeah, a little a little over two months, basically. So there's a couple different things that that kind of they gave us. So the first is yeah. So there are five five challenges, meaning five kind of repositories of code. Each of those code repositories could have multiple bugs, but those were uh, the Linux kernel, nginx, SQLite, Apache Tika, and Jenkins. And then they also had basically broken down the types of bugs into seven different categories. But basically, we had the most the most of those bug categories, which is heavily uh, kind of incentivized. So you know, our system was one of the basically one of the only ones that was working on Java as well as C problems. Um, and so you kind of get a bonus if you're working on a more diverse set of things. And then we also had the most achievements. And the achievements are a little bit weird, but it's basically if you were the first one to submit a bug or submit a patch for that bug. Um, so we were first in both of those categories. Um, so we don't know exactly exactly what the score, like exactly what the numerical score is, but given how the scoring is set up, we got first place. So. I think for both of us, um, we have a background in competitive security competitions and Tyler has also competed in the Cyber Grand Challenge. So we are just kind of attracted to competitions in general. I think it's a very fun format to demonstrate skills and learn new skills. And for me personally, I guess, I was always interested in learning how to use sort of the, the latest LLMs and other AI techniques to build various types of useful tools for security. And this competition was just a great uh, environment for me to pursue that. And that's kind of what got me excited about it. And sort of motivated me to join Tyler in building our CRS. Yeah. You know, not just the two of us, but basically all of theory is kind of very entwined with this uh, competitive uh, security competition things. So I think it's a really good fit for us to participate in because we're really good at these things. And it's special about not just being good, but being able to point and say like, look, we're so good. Here's a third party that is able to say like, you know, we did a good job, makes us feel good inside. It's also $2 million, which is a nice way to convince company that it's worth our time to be working on and things like that. Sometimes disadvantages to having a lot of people too, right? You know, you have kind of too many people trying to go different directions. We had the benefit of knowing each other well and of working together and kind of, so we didn't have too many kind of clashes about what we should be doing. There was some challenges just trying to get everything done in time. And there were a lot of things that we had to kind of give up on or just put off until maybe the next, uh, the final round, which will be in 
next August. You know, I think we both are, again, do research and development kind of in our day to day. So this was a nice thing for us to work on because it's a very clear application of our skills. We kind of just wanted to focus on what we knew we could get done within our time frame and try to make it as robust as possible. We had a lot of discussions, a lot of frequent meetings to sort of bounce ideas off each other to align towards that goal of building sort of what we thought was the most functional system in the amount of time that we had. So in, in some ways, having a small team really lets you optimize in, in ways that you couldn't with a large team like that. We also worked in not just like building systems, but also doing the software auditing that, you know, we do at Theory. A lot of the stuff that we did was kind of like think about how if we were given the same challenge as a, as a human, how we would solve it and then try to write that up in some way that we can kind of put in a shove in a box and have a computer do. So I think a lot of the skills that we've learned and, you know, been, been practicing and honing at theory are very helpful for this sort of thing as well. Yeah. Uh, so I guess it's not very surprising, um, given the short time frame, we wanted to use a language that we were very familiar with and allows you to very rapidly iterate. So we chose Python for that. We kind of tried to use very easy to use open source um, frameworks for interacting with the LLMs and for integrating other security tools into. Yeah, I mean, we used um, GPT-4.0 and Claude, and we sort of tried to combine them and use them to enhance traditional security tools like fuzzing and static analysis and other things like that. Yeah, so we have about 11 months. So the, the nice thing is, you know, it's a lot more time than we had for, for kind of our first iteration. So that backlog of stuff that, that we think is going to be good ideas that we'll have time to work on. So that'll be nice. Most of the code that we wrote, we're probably just going to throw out and rewrite from scratch because it was written in such a rush that we're a little bit worried about how reliable it is. I think the other thing that we were, we're looking forward to is doing a lot more testing and like actual science, because especially with something like LMs where you know, maybe you ask it a question and you can run it 10 times and get 10 different answers. It's hard to know if you're making things better or worse when you make a change. But hopefully, if we get started early and have enough things running, we can do tests where we can see over time, like, oh, okay, we made a change. And like, I can tell statistically that made an actual advantage as opposed to like, I ran it one time and it looked like it worked. So let's just ship it. So there's a lot of things around that, which I, I'm I'm hopeful will will make our system a lot better for, for the final round. Also, hopefully we'll uh, be able to get some other folks to help us out, either from theory or hired elsewhere or something, but it'd be useful. So, yeah, I guess I I don't want to say that I was skeptical going into the competition, but I definitely was not convinced that AI would provide a significant advantage over traditional security methods. And I think throughout developing our CRS and sort of just seeing the results of the competition, I'm a little bit more convinced that AI and like the current generation of AI with large language models does have very specific useful applications to security. And if you engineer around them properly, I do think that they can significantly enhance the current security methods that we're using in the industry. Kind of like Tim, I, I had some skepticism about what kind of an AI system was going to be able to do for security. I think I've been surprised kind of in both directions as we do developments. Like sometimes we'll find something where it's like, wow, that did a really good job. Like I'm surprised that it was able to do that. And then other times you're like, that's really easy. That's like a basic thing that like high school student or something could, could have done with no problem. And it sits there like stuck in a loop or something trying to submit a patch for a file and can't get it working correctly or something like that. So there, there's kind of both sides of it where like it's really good in some ways and really dumb in other ways. But I think there's clearly a lot of possibilities uh, already, even with the current generation. So I think, I mean, there's a lot of different places for AI and cybersecurity. So I think part of the nice thing about a competition like this is, you know, you get kind of an easy, like uh, an easy bundle of what you're supposed to look at. If you look in the real world, like if you're trying to scale up to so analyze every piece of software, you're going to get things where it's like, I don't know how to build this. 
I don't know how to talk to it. I don't know anything like that. And I think a lot of those places are great places for AI and LLMs to help. Ask an LLM, like, how do I build the software? Like, maybe you get an error message and you copy paste that into ChatGPT. And you're like, what am I supposed to do now? Some of the time it works. And there's a, I think there's a lot of tooling that can be built around that to make that more robust. I mean, it sounds a little silly because that's not specifically a security problem. But at the same time, if someone asks me to go look at this project I've never seen before, probably the first several hours of my time is going to be spent on doing kind of those annoying tasks. And I think having AI step in and get it to like some easy level where like everything is nicely packaged up is going to make a huge deal. And then you can start doing the actual analysis and all that other stuff. And I think, you know, LLMs can can really help. And I think kind of in the near term, like the next, I don't know, couple of years or so, that's probably what it's going to look like. I think we're still going to keep doing human software audits, things like that. But if LLMs can kind of raise the, do the, the first few hours of what the software audit's going to look like, or if they can find easy bugs that would be most likely to be exploited by hackers, um, I think that would be a huge deal. And hopefully we'll work on building those systems. So I think there's kind of a couple of parts. You know, as I mentioned before, like some of the stuff around how stuff is packaged means that this is only going to work in kind of specific scenarios. But at the same time, I think that's kind of one small component of a pretty large system. And so I think a lot of the techniques that are used and kind of a lot of the tools that are built to make these systems work around big code bases, I think people are going to use almost immediately working in the cybersecurity field and working on tools for for helping companies uh, work on their security. You know, I think we're probably going to work on integrating a lot of this probably over the next year so that kind of when when things are ready, you know, this can be used immediately to be helping customers or helping, you know, open source projects or things like that with security. So I do think that even though there's limitations, I think there's a lot of opportunities already with with this technology and it's already going to be used. <laughs> a um, lot of GPUs. A lot of GPUs. I, so also, I, I did the math, and apparently we can rent a mega yacht for two weeks with $2 million. So mm-hmm. if we want to build our version 2 on a mega yacht, we have two weeks. Well, if we get all of theory on the mega yacht, then it'll scale up well, right? We have uh, 100 people working for two weeks. That's a lot of... Mm-hmm. I, mean, I guess one thing that I think we learned from this is also that just going out and building something, you know, you can you can get pretty far and there's a lot of cool things that you can work on. You don't need a big team. You don't need that much time. So people should go out and build stuff and kind of play around with LLMs, play around with security. And I bet they can do some really cool things. When we were starting this, I, I wasn't sure if two people in two months was going to be enough to qualify, but I think we were able to really come together and produce something that was robust and sufficient. And I, I was quite impressed with how far you can get with just focusing on simple, good ideas and trying to implement them in a in a nice way. You know, you don't need a big team. You don't need a lot of resources. You should just go and try to build something. If you want more information about our system or anything else, check out our blog post below. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks.